Hello everybody and welcome to the uh, Thermodynamics module, lecture number five. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, pure substances. Uh, we're interested in uh, thermodynamic properties and we're going to get these properties uh, or values for these properties from our steam tables uh, and we're going to look at uh, how to do that today in fact. Um, now the material is in chapter four of the handbook. Um, and it's essentially a reading exercise. It's not too difficult. It's just really terminology um, and how to use the steam tables. And the way I'm going to approach the problem then is to, uh, to solve a particular problem and apply the tables to, to solve this problem. Um, now, you may recall, thus far, we've defined our system and we defined the properties of the system. We've got quite a few properties now. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves what we have. So this is our system. Uh, and thus far, we've introduced, <coughs> well, the zero floor gave us temperature, didn't it? We had pressure, we saw that. We had volume or specific volume. Um, the first law then gave us energy, which was U. Uh, well, yes, I'd call it U. Um, and also we found uh, enthalpy as well, which we call H, capital H for the extensive form of enthalpy. Uh, and also we got the specific heat, didn't we? Cp and Cv. Uh, and what we want, of course, we need data to be able to, we need information about uh, our systems that we're going to analyse. Uh, CP and CV values, for instance, also enthalpies and energy, temperatures and those type of things. We need to be able to um, uh, have data uh, to, solve, to solve problems. We're interested in today in the, the behaviour of uh, substances. So probably most people will know that substances have, well, all substances have three phases. Uh, and these phases are solid, liquid and gas. Also called vapour as well, some people call it that. We'll see when we should call it that. So, so three phases and the focus for us is going to be from the liquid to gas. So liquid and gases are uh, uh, thermofluids, if you like, uh, which is of principal interest. But also, of course, um, you know, when you're talking about phase change, uh, melting, um, go from solid to, uh, to liquid or suffocation, going in the opposite direction or freezing of it in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of water. Um, liquid to gas, of course, uh, boiling. Uh, vaporization, lots of different words for a lot of these transformations that take place. We also find with materials that they can coexist. So you can have combinations of solid and liquid, uh, liquid and gas, even solid and gas. You can have combinations of these phases and for a particular pressure and temperature, they, they, they will coexist. Um, so that's of interest. And when the three coexist, you usually call it the triple point. So, usually we'd indicate the behaviour of these things on our state diagrams. Uh, so let me just have a, uh, a sketch of a state diagram, just to show you the type of thing that we get. Uh, as I said, I'm going to focus mainly on um, the liquid gaseous transformations. Uh, so typically on a state diagram, uh, if I start a range of temperatures and a range of specific volumes there, um, and if I just let me draw in, in the dash line, this boundary. And what we've got then for a range of temperatures, um, we're going to have on this side of the thing for quite uh, low specific volumes or so high density, uh, that's going to be our liquid, yes? So liquid here, so let's call that an L. Um, if we go for high specific volumes, uh, very low density, then uh, that would be our gas, our vapour, let's call that. 
V for vapor, and in between those two, uh, we have a combination of the two, so liquid plus vapor. Um, so, and if I plotted an isotherm, uh, not an isotherm, an isobar, well, we'll see an isotherm in a second, but an isobar, constant pressure, then what we might expect to see is something like this. Um, so, as the temp uh, as the temperature increases for constant pressure, we'd expect the volume to increase. So I think we'd see this type of thing. We'd go along here. We'd reach some point here on this dashed line, which is the interface between uh, the liquid and on its own, a pure phase and a combination of two phases there, liquid plus vapor. And as we go along this thing, we, we tend, what happens is you go along at constant temperature, also constant pressure, and then go up in that direction like that. And this is a P equal to a constant, an isobar. So this is typically what happens. Uh, so this, these lines, well, there's a point here, a very important point, uh, but let me uh, tell you what these lines are. This is the saturated liquid uh, line. So this dash line here, this all, let's do that, saturated line. And this this other one here, the other dash line, the other side of the that point I've indicated is the saturated liquid vapour line, sorry. Now this line is the critical point. Above which, essentially, the distinction between uh, liquid and vapour has vanished. Um, and essentially over here, we call this, well, it's supercritical vapour, it can be called but gas as well is the usual way to refer to that. There's no distinction between vapour and gas, there's still you know, this is water, it's a pure substance, it's still the same substance, there's no, uh, we tend to view gas, if you like, as anything above this, this temperature, this critical, uh, the temperature this occurs at is the critical temperature, um, above which just essentially there's no transition reg region between the, uh, the liquid and the vapour, uh, there's no distinction between them, it's essentially gas. Uh, so this is this is typically the type of behavior that takes place. We can we can identify regions where the liquid is. We can identify regions where the uh, combinations of the two are uh, and uh, and vapor as well. Obviously, for very low temperatures, down the bottom here is solid. Of course, uh, you know, if, it was, if it was if it was water, it would freeze, and you'd you'd have ice. Of course. Um, well, this is typically what you, what you get. We can we can uh, also draw. I suppose the other one we could draw is the pressure. We could look at pressure from V, uh, and you get the same thing. You just get this, this region here. And if I drew an iso isotherm in this case, then what the, what that would look like? It would do something like this. So you come down in this direction. Again, you get this horizontal line. And you come down, uh, so this is an isotherm, T equal to a constant. <coughs> so T equal to a constant uh, in that case. Uh, well, these, these particular uh, transitions between the uh, liquid and liquid plus vapour, um, these points here on the saturated liquid line, saturated vapour line, a tabulated you will find so if i was looking so let's draw that again so let's t plus v t against v um uh, oh probably should make that dashed <laughs> let's do that <laughs> let's put that transit that uh, transition line in so here if i'm on this line uh v if i come down here this is vf is tabulated in the uh, tables, and this one is VG. Uh, that's tabulated in the tables. 
the temperature uh, well I'll call it T, little t, because it's in degrees Celsius in the tables. So let's call that, uh, this is Ts, this is the saturation temperature uh, for water, the boiling temperature then, yes. Uh, it will depend on pressure. Uh, we've got pressure equal to a constant. If we have different pressures, then uh, we'll find the boiling temperature changes, um, as we might expect. If you increase the pressure, uh, it will suppress the, the boiling temperature. Um, well, it's suppressed the, it's suppressed the, it's suppressed the uh, molecules uh, leaving the liquid and therefore the boiling temperature will increase as you increase the pressure. Um, uh, so the, the saturation temperature uh, will depend on the pressure. Uh, so you could cut this, P equal to a constant. Uh, you will find, therefore, that um, you will find that um, the temperature and pressure uh, are not independent, they are related um, um, and uh, in this particular regi regime, for instance, we've got T equals a constant there. Um, and so along that, we can see therefore that the, uh, the pressure and temperature are not independent, one is related to the other. So the boiling temperature or the saturation temperature will occur uh, a particular value for that will occur at a particular pressure. Um, and thus, what we're going to find today, we're going to introduce a new property. When we get into this regime, which uh, the liquid and vapour regime, uh, we're going to need another property to identify uh, uh, the amount of uh, liquid and vapour in that regime. And that's called the dryness fraction. We'll get onto that uh, a bit later on. Uh, in the thing, in the, in the, in the in discussion. So, so, so these are, as I said, these are, these are tab, these things are tabulated, saturation temperatures are tabulated in the tables. Um, and, uh, and there's various, <coughs> in the tables, we can identify, in fact, where to look. So if you look at your steam tables, you'll find that on the liquid, in the liquid regime, uh, this is on page 10, for instance, but for, for water, uh, there's other substance, I'm not going to focus on them today, but I'm going to focus on uh, the water. I'm, doing, I'm going to do a problem on them. Um, and the wet vapour, we call this uh, wet vapour in here. So that's our liquid there, uh, wet vapour, uh, or liquid plus vapour, but we, wet vapour or wet steam for, for, for H2O. Uh, pages two to five. So pages two to five. And in this re regime, um, where we've got uh, vapour or steam, of course, for, for H2O, then that's uh, pages six to eight. Six to eight, and that's for steam, essentially, uh, um, or wet steam here for H2O water of course for the liquid so that's for H2O they're the pages referring to H2O so this is for H2O uh, you'll find the data that you need uh, uh, so we'll find in uh, for instance we'll find the liquid uh, uh, page 10 this is where we'll find our VF, VF value which is the, this value here uh, and on pages well the rest of the pages you can find VG for instance uh, but we're also going to find HF, HG for enthalpy, a specific enthalpy. Um, not so much in U. We'll, uh, there is there is values of U uh, as well, um, but uh, also entropy as well. That's another one we haven't covered yet, but that's tabulated as well in in the tables, uh, and they're given uh, for different pressures and different. Well, different saturation temperatures and different saturation pressures, uh, you will find uh, tabulations for all the properties that we're interested in um, on the course. So what I want to do now, I just want to have a go at uh, uh, solving a particular problem uh, using the tables, just to show you how to, how, to, how, to, how to do that. Okay, so let's do that. <laughs> 
So as I said, this subject, you've really got to just read, read about it. Uh, there's lots more information in chapter four than I'm going to talk about. Just get familiar with the terminology that's there. Uh, it's not difficult. Um, my focus today then is really just to show you uh, how to apply uh, the tables, how to uh, solve a problem uh, uh, using the tables. So what I'm going to imagine, uh, so a problem is just have an example. So I'm going to imagine um, uh, our, our typical system that we've been looking at, where we've got our uh, piston. Uh, we've got a weight on this, uh, if you like. We've got a weight, uh, and, and it's going to be water, it's to water, uh, in here. And we're going to start off with this system being liquid. Um, and I'm going to put some heat into this thing. I'm going to supply energy in the form of heat, and this thing will expand. Uh, and we're going to go through a series of uh, states that are going to be of interest to us. Uh, so let's start. This is our, this is our temperature versus specific volume diagram. Let's draw our transition boundary uh, and we're going to go something like this and we're going to specify different points one two three four five so identifying five state points on the diagram uh, and we're going to start off with a temperature T1, T1 equals 20 degrees C. We're going to start off at liquid. We're going to set the pressure, so the pressure in this thing, since it's just a weight on the, uh, on, on this, I don't know, system, it's a, uh, it's, that weight's going to be, be the same forever, no matter how much heat I put into the system, is a constant pressure. And P, we're going to make it 2 bar. Let's make P equal to 2 bar. Um, so 2 bar, as you know or you've read, it's 2 bar is 10 to the 5 newtons per metre squared. Yes, so uh, or 10 squared uh, uh, new, uh, kilonewtons per metre squared. Uh, so to, we use bar in the... Uh, uh, in the thermodynamics module, essentially because one bar is the approximately one atmosphere. So it's quite convenient for that. Uh, so we're going to start off then. We know the, the starting point. We've got temperature is equal to 20 degrees C and, um, and pressure. It's going to be constant pressure all the way along this uh, thing. Uh, and that's going to be at two bar. Uh, we can go to the table straight away and it will give us the saturation temperature Ts, which is T2. Well, T2, T3, T4, it's a constant temperature there, but Ts uh, from the tables, uh, if we look at the tables, and I've wrote that down, uh, it's, um, it's 120.2 degrees C. So a Ts turns out it was 120.2 uh, degrees C. So that's the boiling. So once we've got a, if you like, once we've got a pressure of two bar on the system, uh, we put heat into this system, going 20 degrees C. As soon as the temperature reaches 120.2, it will boil. So this is higher than the typical 100 degrees C that you would, would typically boil at in one atmosphere. So by increasing the pressure of our system, um, we find that uh, to get it to boil, for the transition to take place from liquid to vapour, uh, we have to increase the temperature a bit more, it's 120.2 degrees C, uh, according to our tables. Um, uh, so uh, you'll find that uh, on, uh, on page four of the tables. Uh, when you look, if you have a look at uh, pressure of two bar 
you'll find uh, saturation temperature uh, is given by that particular value. Um, you also find we've got other values we can we can write down. Um, we have uh, uh, well, we have the, the VG value, which I'm looking for, which I can't see. Oh, there it is. 0 point, uh, 0 0.8 eight five or not point eight eight five kilojoules. So we know the so we can work out the VG, let's do that one then VG is that value VF is that value uh, and we we've basically been told if you look at the tables not point eight eight five meters cubed per kilogram that's what the units are for uh, VG. So again we can uh, pressure of two bar we can various things we can we can uh, this is on page 10 vf um uh, page 10 is for the liquid regime so liquids here remember so this is water um so you can find the find the value of vf there um well vf is remember liquid is more or less incompressible yes uh, so we find, in fact, um, the the value of VF doesn't change that much for liquid. R liquid, uh, typically, you can write it as 0 0.001 meters cubed per kilogram. I mean, that is um, probably you, uh, one over the density, yes, one um, one thousand kilograms meter cubed for density of water, typically. Uh, it does vary slightly, as you imagine, with temperature, but uh, not by much. Uh, so typically uh, a value of VF of 0 0.001 is generally good enough. Uh, I think you've got the tables, you'll find it's got a 0, 06 after it, uh, if you go to page 10. Uh, so not much difference there. Uh, what I'm interested in finding out uh, today, I want to figure out... Um, uh, enthalpy. We're going to look at enthalpy, uh, the change in enthalpy as we go from uh, point 0.1 to 2, 2 to 3. 3 is in the mid mid range, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, uh, 3 to 4 uh, and then from 4 to 5. Uh, the temperature at 5 we're going to say is it's quite high, let's make it 250 degrees C. So T5 uh, equal to 250 degrees C, I just specified that, uh, but it's a superheated, it's above the 120, so this TS is equal to 120.2, so it's above there, so, and this is our superheated steam, uh, so superheated steam, uh, and of course in steam turbines and things like that, this is uh, uh, something that's used. So let's imagine then we've got liquid in here initially, we're going from one to two, and we want to work out uh, the change of enthalpy. Uh, how do we go about doing that? And we face our first immediate problem when we try to do this. And we'll find in the tables, there's very little information in the, in the liquid uh, regime. It gives you the saturated data, which is generally data that's along these lines. So in the liquid, it's on this line, the saturated liquid line. Uh, but nothing in the uh, nothing much uh, in the in the in the liquid regime. But there's two ways we can go about this, and one of this is what we've got a formula, so we can write H two minus H one, and we we discovered a formula last time, didn't we? Uh, and this is CP times T two, uh, and we we'll make it T two minus T one. Yes. Um, now we do have some information about CP, and that is on page ten. Uh, and I'm going to use CP. If you look at the, it does vary between uh, uh, the temperature range. So CP will vary between twenty degrees and uh, one hundred and twenty degrees, but not much. Uh, so I'm going to use it. Uh, the value of four point two kilojoules per kilogram K. Oh, really we see if that's, uh, so 4.2 is going to be my value. Uh, so what I can do, if I want to work out the difference between H2 and H1 therefore, 
we can just apply this formula, which is 4.2 times uh, T2, which is uh, TS, of course, it's 120.2. Well, take away 20, so 120.2, take away 20, which is equal to 4.2 times 100.2. Uh, which is well, essentially it's, it's uh, well, it's just a hundred times that, isn't it? So I wrote it down anyways, but um, it turns out to be 420 point, well, 420.8, 420.8 oh, yeah, that was easy, uh, kilojoules per kilogram. K. So there's so there's one way of working it out using our CP value, which we um, which we derived last time. Um, so and that gives us a reasonable a reasonable value. We've had to approximate this. If we look at it uh, again, you'll find that because of the uh, the focus tends to be on temperature when you when you're looking in this regime rather than pressure. You tend to ignore the pressure. Pressure has a very little effect on things. Uh, temperature is a really important factor, and I did remem remember I mentioned that the sea itself depends quite significantly on temperature, not so much on uh, on pressure. So we tend to look at um, we tend to look at um, uh, what the temperature is doing when we look at these values, uh, and that's this the value I've selected is sort of somewhere in between uh, 4.18 and 4.21 or something like that. Uh, so it's, I, I picked I picked a sort of intermediate value for that uh, to give us a, a, a reasonable answer. Uh, there is an alternative way as well of working this thing out, uh, and that is from the the, the tables directly. Uh, and again, it's looking at uh, as I mentioned, we've we've uh, there's a most of the data is in the tables at the such is from this line where temperature and pressure are related. Um, but if you ignore the link to pressure, which you can do uh, in this regime, uh, because most things depend on temperature, then you can also get a value for H1. Um, so what we find for H2, if we go to the tables, we find that H, uh, the H2 value, well, H2 is equal to the, well, is that the saturation value? Uh, from on the tables, we'll find on page uh, page four again that uh, H2, which is equal to HF, uh, is equal to 5 or 5 or 5.5, 5 or 5 kilojoules per kilogram, for instance. So you'll find that, uh, just reading from the tables on page four, that... Um, if you go to the pressure of two bar, you'll see the saturation temperature. But along the, on, the, on that table, you've come across HF, which is this value. So H2, the, H2 then is HF. You can read off, you can read off VF as well, VF on page 10, but HF is given there. And also HG is given there, which is this one. So those values are, are given there. And also HFG, which is the difference of uh, <laughs> subtract HF from HG. That's the, another value that's given there as well. Uh, we'll see why that's convenient to have that value. Uh, but HF we've given, uh, but we're not given H1, uh, but we are given, uh, if you go to page two and look at the temperature of 20 degrees C, it will give you a value for uh, which we can approximate as H1. Um, uh, so this is on page two, and it's I find on page two that H1 then is approximately equal to, let's have a look at that value, and it's um, 83.9, 83.9 kilojoules uh, per kilogram. So that's at 20 degrees C. Uh, where I've ignored the pressure. Uh, the pressure is very low, actually, for that. Um, uh, so I'll be, uh, this is an approximation based on the fact that 
Uh, in the liquid regime, enthalpy depends on temperature. You know, pressure pressure has a little effect. I mean, it doesn't change much when you increase the pressure of a liquid. After all, it doesn't really change the volume much. It's a uh, it's incompressible uh, nylon uh, for a lot of our considerations. Um, so we find this. This is what we find. And if we work out is two minus h one then, which is equal to five or five minus uh, eighty three point nine. Well, I'm working out rather than working out in my head. Um, so I'm finding that's going to give me. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, there we are, 421.1, 421.1, 421.1, two, kilojoules per kilogram. Um, which is, uh, well, there we go. That's our previous value, wasn't it? 420.8, so pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, uh, alternative way to do this. Uh, so a little bit of nuance required with the tables, a little bit of insight required in the liquid regime because there's a total absence of data uh, in that regime. But uh, we can use the saturation values uh, that was given there. As I say, these, these, uh, all these values here are saturation values. h one's a saturation value, in fact, I've used. But at the temperature of 20 degrees C, the pressure is very low. Uh, the pressure is wrong, of course, because the pressure is too bar all along here. So uh, that, therefore, the, if there's any link between the behaviour of enthalpy and uh, pressure, that's been missing essentially. But the link is very small, uh, and we find uh, that we can get away with that. Also, we can use the CP value, but again, CP just change. Uh, um, and even there, in the in, if you look at page uh, ten. It'll have CPF, you'll find it's got left after the P, and that again is the saturation values of CP. So, uh, um, of course, we're not in, we're away from the saturation line, but in fact, I mean, it's, um, yeah, not, not, not far away. That's the, uh, my diagram probably exaggerates how far away we are from that line. Okay, we've gone from H1 to H2, so that's how we go from H1 to H2, and we use the tables. Uh, a little bit of insight needed, and a little bit more, I think, is said in the in the tutorial and uh, the problems uh, and and book about interpolation in the in the liquid regime. There, so you can read that. So let's now go to uh, to the, somewhere along this line. I'm I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about the midpoint, uh, and as I mentioned, pressure and uh, and temp and temperature are not the independent in there. And we need to introduce another, another, um, another property. So what we imagine at the moment then, we're putting our heat in there, we've got our system, and we're starting to form vapour. And if I did my diagram, if I, well, I've just, if, I just do the, if I just do the system, if you don't mind. So there's my system. And what we've got then uh, in there, so let me just draw, draw it like that. That's our liquid. And here, whatever that is, that's our vapor. Yes. Um, so, what we're imagining in oh, let's put it, let's do the let's do the system. The piston. We're in there, and in the system itself, uh, we've got both liquid and vapor uh, in uh, uh, coexisting at the same temperature. By the by, the temperature of the liquid and the temperature of the vapor is the same. So it's, it's along here, and the pressure is identical as well. So there's no distinction. What's happening, of course, is that molecules are jumping out uh, from the liquid and um, uh, lower energy. They've got a lower energy, and they're going into the vapor, uh, and they're colliding with the vapor. The other molecules then are dropping back into the liquid. So this this dynamic behavior is going on, which we're, we're it's an, e an equilibrium, but dynamic equilibrium. Uh, that's taken place there, but both liquid and vapor are coexisting. Um, and I'm assuming the liquid's at the bottom because of gravity, uh, essentially. But you know, if it wasn't, uh, there was no gravity there, then this would be all mixed up. You, you wouldn't be able to distinguish it, to be honest. Um, 
So we've got liquid and, uh, and what we can deduce then from here, and I'm going to look at the situation where I've got equal amounts of volume of liquid uh, and equal amounts of uh, uh, volume of, uh, of, of, of vapour, uh, steam if you like, um, and what we can do then is uh, say, okay, well, uh, the total volume of in the total volume that we've got must be equal to the mass times the specific volume, and I'm going to call this specific volume v x. Just we'll see why in a second. So that's the mass. The mass is constant, of course, in our system. The mass is constant, um, and this is the specific volume um, of the total thing. Yes. Um, uh, defined to be the, the, the volume divided by the mass, well, that's, that's what that is. Um, and of course, this thing is going to be equal to the volume of the, um, the volume of the liquid. Uh, so let's call that a VF uh, plus the volume of the uh, of the steam. Let's call that VG gas, if you like, the volume of the. Uh, so the total volume, of course, is is consisting of both the volume of the uh, the the uh, fluid, the, the liquid, uh, plus the volume of the glass. Uh, these, of course, we can write this as M F uh, little V F plus M G little V G. Now M. Is equal to the mass of the fluid plus the mass of the gas, isn't it? That's given by that. Well, if uh, what I can do then is divide through by the uh, by the mass, and we're going to define uh, uh, something called the dryness fraction. I'm going to call the dryness fraction. I'm going to define this to be x. This is where my x is coming from. Um, so a bit better. My dryness fraction x is going to be equal to I'm going to, what's better mg over m uh, is what I'm going to call my dryness fraction. Um, so what I'm going to do then is divide through. Um, well, before I do that, we can see from this relationship, if I divide through by m, we get one equal to mf over m plus mg over m. mg over m is equal to my x, so mf over m, mf over m is equal to 1 minus x. So that's a little formula there. So given x is equal to mg over m, then mf over m is equal to 1 minus x. Yeah, straightforward, yes. So if I divide through by m, I get vx is equal to mf over m, which is 1 minus x. vf plus mg over m, which is equal to x vg. Uh, well, that's good enough. You can write it like that, or alternatively, you can write it as vf is equal to no not v, vx is equal to uh collect, collect the x's up plus x sorry times uh, vg minus vf is given by that that formula so vx there's the formula then uh, specific we want the specific uh, volume uh, of the mixture and we know VF and as I said VF and VG are tabulated they're given to you uh, then um, um, and you know the dryness fraction which is a half I was thinking for this particular example um, where we had equal amounts uh, then you can work out the VX but also you can work out all other uh, properties in exactly the same way. So x is our dryness fraction. It only has meaning in this regime, by the by. Uh, it's when uh, it, x so x varies so x varies between zero and one. Okay, uh, it's a property of the system. 
it tells you how much liquid and how much uh, vapor you've got. So it's, it's, uh, it's more certainly a property. It doesn't depend on the path. Um, and it lies between zero and one. And you can only use it when. Uh, uh, so to fully quantify the state of our system, uh, when you're in this regime, in this um, trans transition regime, when you're going from liquid to vapor, uh, you need the X value that will tell you what the uh, <coughs> how much <coughs> of each substance you've got, how much of each phase you've got. <coughs> Sorry. Well, of course, you can do this for volume. All your extensive properties, when you think about it, you can say, oh, H, for instance, is equal to H. Uh, F plus H of G, yes. Uh, we, can, we can write that like that. Um, and of course, then that is equal to M H F plus M, sorry, M F H F plus M G H G. That's what we mean by, by that. Add in the enthalpies of extensive properties for the, for the liquid and extensive properties for the, uh, for the gas. They're extensive, you can add them, you know, to get the total. Uh, and of course, that H is M HX, so that's what we'd call that, wouldn't we? And exactly the same formula pops out. HX, therefore, is equal to HF plus, well, uh, in the tables, you'll find that this difference is also tabulated. Uh, when you look at the tables, um, where it gives you H, G and H, F. You look at the middle column, gives you H, F, G. So this gives X, H, F, G. So that's a more convenient way. Uh, and of course, you can do the same for entropy as well. So entropy, we haven't done that yet, but uh, I think one, one of the exercises, you would be required to read the table, so I might as well put it down. So S, X, specific enthalpy, SF plus X, uh, S, F, G. And you can do it for all extensive properties. Uh, and, you know, um, you get your specific properties out of it using the dryness fraction. So it's a very convenient thing then. It allows you to, allows you to work out uh, properties in this intermediate phase. If you know the dryness fraction, then of course you just specify it and you can apply any of these formulas to work out uh, specific volume, specific enthalpy, specific entropy, uh, also uh, specific uh, inter intrinsic internal energy as well. Uh, as I, I mentioned last time, remember that when, we've, uh, when we're in the phase change, when we're having a phase change going on where temperatures are constant, we can't use our CP and our CV values. Uh, it's not appropriate for there. Uh, I use CP here, but that was here. We've got a, temp we've got a gradient, a change with temperature. Uh, but when we went to this regime, we could not, uh, we could not use the, uh, we could not use the values uh, in that way. Um, okay, we still, we still got ten minutes left. So let's. Uh, where are we up to? Okay, we've got to, we've got to, uh, we've got to point three, uh, which I want to work out. Uh, my values um, and well you can probably see if uh, I'm, I'm working out the enthalpy uh, and what I'm suggesting is I'm using x equal to a half to get me midway between there uh, but we have our from the tables we have our values of, uh, of hf and hg uh, and if I go to this formula um, and set x equals to a half, um, then uh, we can do, well, set x equals to a half there. Uh, we can see, in fact, well, what you get then is that h3, uh, h3 is equal to, in this form, we've got hf uh, plus a half times, well, this is it, hg minus hf, this is what this is. Um, it's given by that result. Uh, so it's the average, isn't it? It's H. It's just um, HF plus HG divided by two. Uh, 
and that gives the formula. So if I know these two values, which I do, I know H2 and H4, which are HF and HG, that's what they are, uh, then it's no real uh, difficulty. So this is equal to H3 is equal to H2 plus H4 over, over 2. Uh, if I put the HG value down, I probably didn't do it. Uh, let's, let's note that value. It's 2707 kilojoules per kilogram. So H2, H2 was equal to 2707 kilojoules per kilogram from the table. So that's that. That's your HG value. Uh, one thing I should mention, you'll notice, well, probably you may have observed in the tables that we are, we are given absolute values for things. Um, and that, you may recall me saying that uh, all we tend to be interested in is the is the difference between things. Yes, uh, and this is true. Uh, but the table somehow figured out a way to specify absolute values. Uh, and they're doing it quite arbitrarily, to be honest with you. Uh, what they've done, they've zeroed the, uh, well, they've used the triple point, in fact, uh, which is just above zero degrees C, um, to specify zero enthalpy, for instance, and zero entropy. Uh, so what they've done there, they've, rather, because you have to do something, I suppose, because the difference doesn't change, when, um, you know, so what they've done, they haven't specified, uh, so they've, they've, uh, Z introduce an arbitrary absolute barrier. Of course, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's not true absolute values because clearly we get entropy uh, and internal energy are not zero at, the, at degree C, you know. Uh, so, but for convenience, this is what they've done. They've just arbitrarily zeroed the, they give a zero value for, for uh, entropy. Uh, enthalpy and entropy. So that's why I'm able to specify particular values of things as far as entropy and enthalpy is concerned is because this is what they've done in the tables. Uh, but it is an arbitrary thing. It's nothing of any funda it's not, no fundamental. It's not fundamental in any way. Uh, okay, so the last thing I need to do, I think, is the uh, is H5. So that just, again, this is just, so that's my dryness fraction. Uh, which again is a lot a bit more more said on it in the tables. Uh, sorry, in the uh, in the handbook. Uh, so you can read about that there. there. Uh, so the last thing I need to do, I think, is just look at um, it's fine. This is in the superheated regime, and that was on pages six and eight, uh, six to six to eight, um, and if you go to page six, so. Uh, for so H five, then what we're after is H five, uh, and uh, sorry, H five. Uh, what's that? Sorry, uh, turn to page six. Uh, on page six, uh, at pressure, uh, pressure of course is equal to two bar. Uh, in this case, T uh, five is equal to two fifty. Yes. 250 degrees C, and you can just read it off. Uh, it gives you in the tables, and I've got a value of 2971 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is the value I got uh, for H5. Uh, and as I said, uh, we're generally interested in the difference, uh, but it will give you the... Um, it will give you the uh, the value in the sense has no meaning per se, other than that it's uh, it's the difference between uh, the value that you're given is the difference between the value of H at uh, the triple point uh, and and two fifty degree and the state uh, of two fifty degrees C at, at two bar. Uh, um, it's it's. Uh, well, temperature being the important parameter there. <laughs> so it's just, it's just, anyways, we, we generally would look at H4 to H5, wouldn't we, as the, as what, what we, would, would be meaningful to us. Um, uh, but in the table, you will find the H5. So you can find, you know, if I want H, uh, 
I can work out h5 minus h4, of course, which is 2971 minus our, uh, our, uh, our hg value, which, uh, which I've now rubbed off, as it turns out, uh, which was 2707. 27. So you can, you, we can work, always work out the differences. That's what we're interested in, uh, rather than these absolute values that we seem to be getting from the tables. Uh, but as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's just an arbitrary thing. What's happened there is that um, the uh, the um, they've zeroed it. They've zeroed the values to, uh, to, uh, at uh, the triple point, uh, so that they can specify numbers. And they've done that for both entropy and uh, enthalpy. Uh, remember that our enthalpy from last time, H is equal to U plus PV. And of course, the big H was equal to big U plus P, big V. Uh, so there are our enthalpy uh, values from last time. Uh, well, OK, so that's been a bit of a breakneck speed, but uh, just a, a brief introduction to the tables, I mean, it's not, not a hard task to uh, to use the tables. You may have to interpolate, that's one thing I didn't mention, but of course with tables, there could be gaps. And in particular, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the superheated steam, uh, there's big gaps, big gaps. Uh, and all we do for our, for our interpolation is use linear interpolation. It's good enough, uh, very good enough for what the kind of thing we're doing. Um, and there's some examples of in, interpolation in the, in the chapter four, so do read about that. I expect everyone can interpolate a linear interpolation, fit a line between um, uh, to fit, fit a linear line and get the values in, on the line. That's the idea of that. Uh, so that's not too difficult. So you have to use linear interpolation if, you, if there's gaps in the data. Uh, I was trying to raise the question so it lands on the data points, but sometimes you can't avoid it. Um, so. But I expect everyone know that's uh, GCSE stuff, really. In the interpolation, we should be able to do that, yes. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll, I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye.